A great interview question for cybersecurity professionals that they can expect to get is, hey, an end user gets a phishing email or they fall for a phishing email, what do you do? How do you react to that? Now, it's typically focused for more SOC analyst, blue team stuff, but it's such a common question and phishing happens all the time that it's not outside the realm of possibility for really any kind of role within the industry. So in this video, I am going to be taking you through my personal workflow on how I respond to phishing emails, the tooling I use to investigate and the communication and techniques that I use. That way, if you get this question in an interview, you will be able to absolutely crush it and demonstrate your capability, your knowledge of tool sets, and what a workflow would look like for you. Let's get into it. Hey everybody, how you doing? A couple weeks ago, I gave a talk for NIST with a huge Q&A panel at the end. And one of the questions I got was, what are common interview questions that I can expect in cybersecurity job interviews? I gave this email phishing one because it really touches on what your technical acumen is, what your workflow is like, the tooling that you're aware of, and it's a really great question. I wanted to make this video to go a little bit deeper and kind of provide that awareness so those who are not sure how to answer that question will have some you know, context and, and know some tooling and stuff like that. Uh, special thanks to Intesa for sponsoring this episode, but more about that later. Now, let's get into the actual phishing email that a user potentially reports. Now, you can see here I've redacted some information, but essentially, uh, end user gets the email they may or may not know this company, who the sender is, but it looks like a legitimate sender. And the email is basically saying, we need you to update your, in, uh, your customer information. This is pretty standard. We need you to do something and give us some information. The URL right here is a PDF. Now, a couple things I want to point out. If we're evaluating this email, um, first off, we're going to look and be like, all right, it looks kind of legit. It doesn't look too fishy. Now, the whole email centers around this particular attachment, right? So we would hover over this attachment and take a look at the URL. The URL is right here. I've already copied it down for you. And it's a OneDrive link. So OneDrive is Microsoft's kind of you know, file storage cloud solution. So when you look at this URL, you may think, hey, this is actually a legitimate website. If you scan OneDrive.Live.com, it would come back as legit because it is Microsoft. So we have to go a little bit deeper. And I'll just as a spoiler, if you've been doing your threat intelligence, staying current on what's going on in our industry, threat actors have realized that URLs will be stripped out if they're malicious or look malicious from emails. So what they do is they'll compromise user uh, accounts, get into the Office 365, set up like a OneNote or a, a malicious file or something like that, and drop the link to it in the email. So the end user, the victim, gets an email like this with a hyperlink like this. It'll pass through uh, screening because legitimate uh, attachments are always uh, fired around uh, in business nowadays, Office 365. And the victim will go to this and that's where the uh, phishing page uh, could be or the phishing, right? So let's investigate this. So one of the very first tools that I would use in this case is URL scan is a great little tool that allows you to drop in a URL, run a public scan, and it will basically uh, insulate you from actually executing um, going to this website on your own personal machine. They'll go there for you. They'll get some telemetry. They'll take a screenshot, which is what I personally use it for most. And it gives you like a quick little understanding of what this is. You can see right here, this is a full image from the page, right? Now you can see that this is a OneNote, which is basically like a journaling Office 365 thing. You can see they've got the company name and here's a view PDF button. So our, our suspicion is that this is a landing page uh, to actually take you somewhere, either to get your credentials or to do something. So first, a uh, little piece of indicator. Now again, everything's gonna show up green because it is Microsoft's infrastructure. All right, so the next tool that I would use in this instance uh, is any.run. So any.run is like a, a dynamic sandbox, but the reason I like to use any.run is because you can go in and drop a um, URL into the, um, in, into it, and it'll go there, and it'll actually dynamically execute um, you know, that page. So URL scan just kind of took a snapshot. Any dot run is going to go to the page. Now I mentioned that Intiser did sponsor this episode. We're going to get into that a little bit later, but I like to use Intiser if I have binaries for analysis. In this instance, it's just web pages. We're just seeing where the, uh, the victim went, right? 
and we're doing it in a secure fashion. We don't want to go there. Yes, our, our end user went there, but we don't want to go there. We want to do as much as we can without touching this infrastructure. So you can see URL, um, excuse me, any.run is going to run. I've already done this uh, in a different window, so we can we can jump ahead. Well, actually, it's doing it in this window. So you can see here it is. Now check this out. This view PDF is what it's all about, right? So if you look, I know it's not resolving on the on the uh, screen here, but trust me, the URL was dollar day something, right? So dollar day club. If you right. look at the bottom, you can see dollardayclub.com is highlighted as a suspicious website. And now we are presented with what looks like an Outlook login, but the URL is dollardayclub.com. Now I know you can't see that, but trust me, um, I'm gonna add some time over here. This URL is clearly malicious. This is not an Outlook landing page. And essentially what we're looking at here is credential harvesting. So Tom at peer2.com, right? Some fake credentials for him. And again, the reason that I'm following this is because I want to see how far I can push it so I can understand what the potential impact was, right? Now, any dot runs a little slow, which kind of is unfortunate, but effectively what I can tell you is when you put in the credentials, uh, it's going to ask you, you know, or username and password, and then it's going to come back and say, you know, it didn't work, please try again. But in reality, you've just uh, submitted your credentials to the threat actor. Okay, so we've confirmed now using URL scan, any.run, and uh, not we didn't have to use integer because we didn't have a binary to analyze. But we've confirmed now that this is a credential harvesting landing page. We may contact the end user back and say, hey, did you actually put in your credentials? Let's assume the end user did put in their credentials. Well, how we would react now is we have to assume that those credentials are burned, okay? We're gonna we're gonna go in and we're going to disable sessions for that user, right? So if if the threat actor has logged in and created a new session token, we want to dis disable and destroy those. We want to force a reset on the username, um, excuse me, on the user's password for Office 365. So now they need to put a new password. Make sure that you configure it for um, change on first login. That way you don't know the end user's password, the victim's password. So now they're good to go. You want to go in and look at the victim's kind of Office 365 infrastructure. And if you got audit logs, see what was done under that account. Two things to look for here. One, look at their email and see if they have configured forwarding rules. Threat actors, like if they're, especially if they're gonna do business email compromise, they love to put forwarding rules in. So emails that come in get forwarded to an email account that they control. That way, if you change the password, they are still getting your emails, right? So they're still kind of aware what's going on and then maybe they spoof your email address or they email back and they'll have context of the conversations going on so they can trick people. Another thing is we just saw how a victim who was compromised got their OneNote uh, section of Office 365 um, taken advantage of for an attack platform, right? Essentially, so it's possible you, your compromised user in your environment, if you have O365, also has a OneNote page set up and it, they're gonna start um, maliciously sending out things. So look at what activity was done under that account in the window of exposure, okay? Now, if you want a couple other things, these are nice to haves, so maybe kind of set you apart in the interview. If you want, you can communicate to the victim and say, hey, uh, you know, obviously you're going to tell them their passwords changed and stuff like that, but also tell them, hey, if you're using that password anywhere else, strongly encourage that you change that password uh, elsewhere because that password's effectively burned. If you don't have multi-factor authentication enabled, you should totally turn it on. By the way, if you have it enabled for your corporate account, chances are that the bad guy was not successful in logging in. There's probably going to be some failed login attempts where they didn't have that multi-factor. Also, if you want to go two steps forward, and be a really great person. I do this personally uh, whenever I can. Contact the victim, like the, the person, that email was sent from a legitimate user account. So that person was compromised. You can Google the company because the domain name will be in the email address. Google the company, find a contact us um, section and call them. I do this all the time. I call them and I say, hey, I'm Jerry. I'm an information security professional for this company out here in South Carolina. Uh, my users are getting emails from this this exact email address. It's strongly believed that that user is compromised. You, you, I would, I would recommend you 
change their password, disable sessions, make sure that forwarding rules aren't on, right? All the same things I just told you and, and kind of, you know, help stem the bleeding from that side. Okay, um, you can also uh, use message headers if you want. I didn't really get into that, um, but now, if there was a binary on the uh, in the email, like as an attachment or something like that, and the end user downloads it local to their machine, and your telemetry doesn't catch it, maybe they run it, I don't know. You got to know what exactly that binary was. For those situations, I use Intezer, the sponsor of this episode, so let's take a look at how I use Intezer. So I use Intezer in my day-to-day -day SecOps triage workflow. So when they asked if they could sponsor a video for Simply Cyber, I was more than willing to say yes because I think it's a fantastic product. This is Intezer. They have Analyze and Protect. The Analyze is the product that I personally use, and I use the free tier. You can analyze up to 50 binaries per month on the free tier. I've been using it for a little over a month and I've only used 12 uh, you know, binary analysis. So I'm well under that 50 threshold. So you might be able to work this into your existing workflow at zero cost. Now, real quick, what makes Intezer particularly interesting is if you look at David Bianco's Pyramid of Pain, this is how difficult it is for threat actors to kind of um, change the way they're doing stuff. Well, with hash values and IP, well, hash values, you can ch change the code, recompile it, no big deal, easy to fix. IP and domain names, uh, you can tear down C2 infrastructure and stand it back up, not too bad. But when you get up into the TTPs, it's very, very tough. The TTPs is like how the malware actually works, how the developer that coded the malware, what, what kind of system calls they use, what type of techniques did they use in their actual coding. And that's what Intezer actually has a huge database of, um, full of malware that they've disassembled and pulled out kind of what they call genes on. This is what we see in, you know, Mirai botnet, right? Like this is the kind of code we see in Mirai. This is the kind of code we see in Emotet. So even if you recompile it with different stuff or you uh, add new functionality, it's still gonna have those genes in it. So this is their uh, page where I spend most of my time. This is a piece of malware I downloaded from Malware Bazaar. You can just drop it in. It does the analysis. So you basically have, I get access to like a team of reverse engineers in 45 seconds versus me trying to reverse engineer this myself or, or stumble through trying to understand what this piece of malware is. Now this is a Quasar rat that I downloaded from Malware Bazaar and I just did it to indicate. Imagine if you, you get in a, a call from an end user who says they accidentally downloaded something or a file appeared or your EDR solution flags a file that you weren't expecting. I use Intezer to be able to give me perspective on whether or not the file is malicious because sometimes it's not malicious and it's a false positive in the EDR. This is like a second um, you know, confirmation and gives a ton more information than just this is a malicious file or not. You can see in here the visibility it gives you. It does a virus total lookup, which is pretty cool. Gives you that SHA value. It tells you, and this is where those genes are, like what kind, like why is it malicious? We got the Quasar Rat, it's malicious packed. Uh, the Blue Stealer, so it looks like some additional functionality from other pieces of rats. And Agent Tesla was incorporated into this particular binary. So you, you can see the value, right? So if, they, if it's, a new, it's a new binary that's not gonna show up in virus total because it's brand new, but it's really just a couple pieces of malware that were cobbled together. Intezer is going to know that and give me that visibility. Now, I do want to point out that they have the ability to kind of generate Yara rules uh, and be able to incorporate that, but it's currently not on the free tier, so I haven't personally taken advantage of it. But the functionality that I'm laying out for you, the ability for me to triage quickly um, and effectively uh, is really the value I get from Intezer. So again, thanks again for uh, sponsoring the episode. Oh, I do want to point out they do have an API if you want to get fancy pants and include some type of SOAR capability. Uh, I personally just use the drag and drop right now, but if you're a slightly larger org or you do have uh, the capability to, to, you know, send it out if it's a, a malware, then immediately isolate the device. Like you'd have to hook it into your EDR solution. Uh, I'm not doing that right now, but the capability does exist. So anyways, check out Intezer. Let me know what you think. All right. I hope that you were able to get a really clear understanding on how you can um, respond, react, handle a phishing incident, the proper ways to communicate, what to look for, and, you know, just kind of some of the, the behaviors of threat actors and how they're kind of bypassing email filtering rules right now with malicious URL links. 
Um, I hope this worked well. If you have other techniques or tools, drop them in comments below. I'd love that. And if this interview question comes up in an interview and you use this information to dominate that question, please let me know. I love when I hear those type of stories. All right. Until next time, stay secure.